brought to you by the Rugby Outlet Mall, equipping you for freedom and connection through rugby. Find out more at RugbyOutletMall.com. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Grow Rugby. My name is Gift Gift Time at Baylu, and I'm glad and so happy to have you here on a brand new week. Uh, you know, it's been a heavy week. It's been a heavy last three weeks. I guess it's technically been a heavy all year round, but... You know, even more so, obviously, with everything that happened and, uh, you know, said my stuff last week. I'm not going to lie. I, you know, sometimes uh, you got to get all that pressure out of you. And uh, there's a lot of internal conflict that goes on. But, you know, I feel good. We've seen a lot of changes. We've seen a lot of brush and a lot of symbolism and virtue signaling. But, you know, there's been some legitimate concepts that have been thrown out there that I, I think are really viable. Though... I'm not a big fan of a lot of the uh, the, the the buzzwording that's being used because it's creating a confusion that's creating like a, an annoying amount of um, uh, uh, conflict against people. And it's like, honestly, the meanings are what you actually agree on. There's there's nothing disagreeable like that. And I'm talking about the defund, disband, the police stuff. Um like the the buzzwords defund and disband are already very controversial. Great for catching sight, terrible for uh, implementing what is actually being said, which is basically, hey, let's take off some burden from cops. They don't need to be this militarized, nor do they need to be the world, the the national. Uh, solver of all problems and then subsequently also the giver of pro like it, it doesn't make sense and honestly it, it's like yeah you want people to be an expert in their respective fields and that if there's a situation call that the dispatcher sends the right people and not just a uh, one size fits all set that are not prepped for every situation and you're just asking too much from just humans like predictable so uh, i i hope they change the buzzword because it's really it's a bad buzzword as opposed to just be like reallocation reformation and not just reformation in just uh policy but reformation in departmental and all the systemic elements that comes with police and everything like that so anyways it's 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 good to see that there is stuff that are moving forward and i hope that it continues to and uh and not even hope no no it needs to make sure it continues to and that that it doesn't just stop with protesting because a lot of people are going to start feeling like oh we protested so we did our job and it's like no this needs to go further so the protests need to make sure it continues to put pressure on those who are able to make changes and not doing symbolic things like kneeling in kente cloth as a means of trying to show solidarity make change you, you literally have the power to do the changes that's your solidarity right legislation 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 ah, people be so crazy but anyways aside from that aside from that we got a great interview uh today nicholas walcott from chicago a chicago griffin you guys might not have heard of this guy but this guy's got a story this guy played overseas professionally He's been in the marketing game. He's been a major contributor to the USA Rugby Club, Chicago Griffins. Not to be confused with the Lions, the rivals, but the Chicago Griffins. And he's a guy that has started to find himself more and more in a prominent role in the development of, kid, of, of the club's in the community as well as the growth within the city of Chicago. Third biggest media market in the U.S. and obviously a place that if you know about the U.S. has always had a lot of controversy with it, but it has been a place where there's a lot of talent and potential from sports to entertainment to commerce to healthcare and so much. Famously, AIG, uh, is housed there and they were the ones that kept bringing in the all blacks to the uh to soldier field in chicago for the games against the u.s and then subsequently against ireland um so like this this is a place that has it and he's been able to be impactful this was a great conversation i i it, it, it was look if it, it it was it, it this is a longie 
This is a longie, but it is worth the listen, and it, we just really go in. This is another one that could have gone for three, four hours, and and uh, it's not even to say that other ones that didn't go that long weren't good. Like, they were great. It's just there's so many little details and so many stories that sometimes you get kind of caught up in the minutia of it, and you're just like, yo, I'm just so intrigued. So this is me being fully intrigued. Nick, great guy, really, really focused, really dedicated rugby guy. I know you guys are going to really enjoy this. And we're back to having sponsors again. So obviously I want to bring back our first sponsor, Rugby Outlet Mall. Go to www.rugbyoutletmall.com. Look, this we are about to start launching off uh, so much of our products. Right now, our premier product is going to be our Singapore to uh, Tokyo Any Way You Can documentary series. When I tell you we are getting rave reviews, and I'm about to show you these reviews, you guys are going to start seeing it. But when I say we are getting rave reviews for how well the documentary is set and how much it means, uh, it's, one, very humbling and very touching for me, uh, uh, considering that, you know, being a part of it and, and having been able to help develop and, you know, put it together along with my friend Jason Bray. Um, but to be able to know that people aren't looking at it as just – a guy that we know it's actually something that we legitimately engaged in so uh it's starting to, it's going you know it's kicking off more and more we want it to be shared to as many people because especially in this time when we're talking about covid and it creates separation when we're talking about solidarity and and creating uh, uh dismantling racial uh, divisions and racial myths and recognizing that we are an equitable component to society in terms of everybody, you know, we're an equitable component um, to it from black lives on and seeing what we can do in other cultures, what rugby impacts like guys, this is this is a real one. This is a real one. And uh, I'm excited to be able to see it. You guys can go go hit it up, rugbyoutletmall.com slash Singapore to Tokyo. And you guys can go ahead and order the movie, the series right there. I promise you, you will not regret watching it. You will not regret it one bit. And then after that, yo, go look through Rugby Outlet Mall. Check out some of the merch. You guys can actually get 20% uh, off any HBCU Rugby Classic or Gift Time Rugby merch. Um... If you use promo code Grow Rugby, that's G R E A U X Rugby, um, it's it's gonna be worth it, man. Continue the symbolization <clears throat> with the HBC Rugby Classic gear. We're obviously gonna be using a part of that money to continue to grow within HBCUs within the community, and that only develops the rugby community both domestically and internationally. So. It's it's some um, again rugbyoutletmall.com. Check out the documentary series Singapore to Rugby any way you can, and of course use promo code Grow Rugby G R E A U X Rugby for any uh, HBCU Rugby Classic or Gift Time Rugby merchandise. So without further ado, I want to have you guys enjoy, have fun, and take into listening this interview with Nicholas Walcott. Oh yeah. Grow rugby, 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 grow rugby. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode. Grow rugby. I got another V. VIP guest for you today. I don't think you guys even realize how VIP it is. There's some Chi Town love coming with the Chicago Griffins, one of the baddest dudes on Roots Rugby. It is Nicholas Walcott. Nick, man, thanks for coming on to the show. Yeah, appreciate it, man. Appreciate it, bro. It's, it's a pleasure, man. Absolute pleasure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. So I only knew you based off initially off of because of Roots. You know, Kyle and Tiana bringing that all together. And then, you know, as we've been able to talk and just being able to see through social media and the, 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 the personality that you have, I'm like, yo, this dude, this dude's about that. Like, I, I, can, I, can, I can chat with this guy a lot. You know, we've, we've had a few conversations. But I think it's interesting, like, just how much this, uh, this rugby connection creates these little networks, right? Because there was no way. I've never played anybody from Chicago. And I, th I swear, the only time I've dealt with Chicago Griffins 
is in passing during a couple tournaments and never had a chance. So right. it's really right. great to be able to see it. But you have a hell of a story, bro. And, yeah. uh, I, you know, kind of dig deep. But I got to ask, though, um, you know, between going through the football to the marketing to to playing rugby, like – at what point do you start going like, look, man, I, I need to swag some of this up myself. Like, how much of this sparkle can I put into into this rugby life? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the funny thing about it, man, I always tell people, uh, I mean, the dream itself, the rugby dream itself started itself. I uh, had a, a friend of mine who, what well, he's a friend of mine now. But when I originally started playing, I played uh, with the Chicago West Side Condors. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this was, I've never played rugby a day of my life. And, uh, you know, I kept having to be out of the practice because a friend of mine, well, a female friend of mine uh, was playing with the women's team. <laughs> was playing with the women's team. So the Chicago uh, Sirens. Mm-hmm. So uh, she came out and uh, I went to a couple of practices and she was like, uh, hey, you know, you know, come on to a couple of practices. So I went to a practice and a guy by the name of uh, Adrian Gannon uh, saw me. You know, he's from a, from a, a Ireland at the time, and another guy, Michael Sweatman, who's from Manchester. So my, Michael comes up to me, Mike, Mike, you're a big lot, Mike. You're a big lot, Mike. You should play some rugby, Mike. I'm like, man, first of all, I'm barely even understanding what's going on right now with, <laughs> in this sport, bro. I don't know anything. I'm just here to support. Mike, you're a big lot, Mike. You should play some rugby, Mike. You should play some rugby, Mike. Big, thick Manchester accent. <laughs> Man, he finally get me to come on out, man. And dude, like I just fell in love with it, man. And the thing about it was, it was it was one of those sports where I felt like my entire athletic background kind of got me to that point. You know, right. you know, I played football, basketball. I played five sports in high school, really. You know, at one point in time, uh, and played college ball, played uh, uh, indoor football, played in the AFL for a second, and uh, you know, I was. Not so much I was done playing, but I was done playing football from that right. perspective. You know, I had a, uh, a workout with the NFL. It didn't work out, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, from that standpoint, I was done playing football. But it was still like this this burning sensation where I still wanted to really do something else. That contact sport need, that contact sport itch, it, it, it never goes truly away. Like, right. once you tap, tap into it, you know, the, maybe the, the presentation, because I, I, I felt the same way that you did uh, I, my, my football career didn't collect as much as yours did, but whenever it was, I played in high school and then I tried in college and, uh, and I'd really, I, I thought about trying to take it up to the next level, but you know, it was something like there was always, eh, it, didn't, it just didn't connect for me. Right. right, right, um, right. And, and then I, you like get into no. rugby and then you're just like, yo, this, this taps into this one measure of mine that is like, I already knew this as a result from playing, but right it feels different. It feels looser, maybe? Right, right. And the thing about it, too, that aspect of being different, that aspect of, of looseness, it was almost even from the standpoint, you know, when I first came out, uh, where, where some people might be a little bit like, oh, man, where's all the brothers at? For right. Me, I'm like, man, ain't no brothers out here. I'm about to, you know, about to do my own. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ride. Let's go. You know? <laughs> You know, and, you know, and then quickly I start saying like, yo, there's some athletes out here too. You know right. what I'm saying? You know, you know I kind of tone it back down. But at the same time too, it was kind of like, yo, like, this is cool, man. Like, I'm about to jump into something, man. Like, ain't nobody even really paying attention to right now, you know, at the time anyway. I know. And look, I, I think that was the exact same feeling. I know um, for me, it, it really always kicked off. Like, I saw it in college, but I thought it was just something archaic. Like, you know, we all, like, mo- we know, like, rugby, football derived out of rugby. I legitimately yeah. thought it was just football was the nat- ev- next evolution of rugby. So rugby kind of went into the wayside and, you know, NFL and football kind of blew out. And right. then whenever I, I got back and uh, I started playing, I'm like, yo, like, one – Yo, there's mad people who play this sport. And two, it's like, why the hell have I never heard of this, like, anywhere? The, the, the thing about it, up to that point, only thing I ever really heard that was outside of football and hockey from a physical standpoint was really lacrosse. Right. You know? Even right. in college, we had a lacrosse team and stuff like that. But we didn't even have a rugby team, uh, you know, when, well, maybe we did, but I didn't, you know, I didn't really know anything about it. You know, I didn't know anything about it. So I was just like, dude, this is, it, it was crazy, man. Like, 
literally when I, like when I first started playing, just the amount that I started learning about the sport and then realized how big the sport was outside right. of the United States, it, it, it blew my mind. You know, I, I think one of the things that have really stood out to me, and I, I you know, I preach it you know, really hard is how much of there being an opportunity, not necessarily just in terms of like on the field, but how much the sport has like this breadth to it. And obviously it's kind of became the point of what this podcast was, but it was like, dude, like this is really far ranging, but weirdly enough, it also feels like it's missing pieces for this. You have this massive sport that has been around for so long, but it still feels like it's not, it doesn't have all the pieces that you would be like, okay, this takes it over the top. But it has the core necessity pieces to be like, no, this can work. We just yeah. need to fill in the blanks here. So right. before we kind of keep going on on that, all right, I kind of want to backtrack a little bit on, on what your, 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 your history was. So obviously you said you were an athlete, uh, both collegiately and uh, low-key professionally. Uh, so for you, what, what was the basis for you in athletics? Like, you're from Chicago. Like, what, what, was your, what was your entry point for that? Well, where I grew up, I grew up uh, south side of Chicago, you know, south suburbs of Chicago, we call it, a.k.a. the Wild Hundreds. Uh, where I grew up, for the most part, everybody pretty much played football and basketball. You know what I'm saying? So my base entry when it came to athletics itself was football and basketball. You know, playing kill the man, you know, when we were kids, you know, or, you know, running varsities, playing up to 21, stuff like that. Uh, playing baseball as well. I, I think the very first uh, sport I played from an organizational standpoint was baseball. Mm -hmm. So I played baseball from, I want to say, eight years old until maybe about, about 15, 16 years old. You know, played a little bit in high school before I started really kind of really focusing really more on, you know, you know football and basketball, stuff like that. Uh, but so from the basis, it was that, but you know, when I was growing up, I mean, we played football, basketball, baseball. If you can swim, you had to go swim. You had to jump off the diving board, you know, <laughs> anything that was athletic, we tried to you do. You got to get it done. I mean, dude, I, mean I, I was at one point, I was probably about a good, what, what, two, two thirteen average bowler. I mean, like I, you know, what, where I grew up, you got to get down. You got to be an athlete. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if not, it's going to be tough for you. Is it just because the nature of the area is just heavily competitive or is it because the nature of the area is like we, we want to see we're the strongest physically and athletics is the one that shows it? The nature of the area, uh, where I was from, that stretch of Chicago, at one point uh, we had more pro athletes than anywhere else in the United States okay. as far as like per, per capita. You know, I remember Thornton High School at one point, they had like seven guys playing in the NFL. My high school, Richards High School, we had – three or four guys playing in the NFL at the same time. Nice. Uh, Ty Streets, who played for uh, the San Francisco 49ers. Dwayne Wade is from my high school. Right. Uh, I mean, so it was just an area where from 100 and, you know, you know, basically from 123rd, which, like I said, it's Camera Park, to all the way out deep south, you know, out in the 200s area, you go out, you out, to, you go out to, like, Flossmoor and everywhere else, that part of Chicago. Everybody plays sports. Everybody, you know, if, if you didn't, it was almost like, you know, you were kind of like isolating yourself. You know, you know, you were, you were like that kid, man, who was almost like he had the plague. Right. You know what I'm so you, you basically you just had to play sports. And with that being said, it was just really competitive. Even on my block alone, my block that I grew up, we had what, including myself, I want to say it was about 10 to 15 college athletes. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So you're talking about like battles. My, my brother was a Division II All-American. You know, uh, my neighbor across the street played at, uh, he was all Big Ten at University of uh, Illinois. Like we had com like straight battles against each other. So, you know, we were just all super competitive. You know, uh, you know, everybody wanted to beat each other at all times, you know. Right. So it was just one of those, those upbringings more, more, more than anything else. And that that and and that makes sense. And again, it, it goes back to that. You almost like I feel like it, it. almost felt like like a bunch of big brother, little brother kind of thing. And you're just developing within that that element, right? right. right. So you you have that going in high school. You have this big athletic format. So it takes you into college. You're playing football at the time or basketball going into college. Football. football. All right. What were you running back, wide receiver? Free, free safety. safety slash I was gonna say, hyper, I was gonna go, linebacker. Say that again. 
said free safety, free, free safety slash like hybrid linebacker. Okay. You know, and, like and in today's game, definitely, I could have probably played a little bit more, you know, linebacker. Back then, just because everybody wanted their linebackers to be 6'3", six, 6'4", six, sometimes. Right. You know, you, you kind of like, okay, well, you need to go and play safety, where truth be told, I've always loved playing linebacker a lot more than playing safety, but, you know. So you kind of had that you kind of had that Brian Erlacher kind of fit where it was like yo I can be a hybrid in either one but they're forcing me to pick the position either right. or you know right. or, or what Tyron Tyron uh, uh Matthews is now a little bit more so Exactly 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 So and, and that was at Northeast that was at Northeast University Northeast is where I finished up I I played college ball at North Park University uh and even that aspect was a long story I was actually being recruited by uh, Michigan State at the time when Nick Saban was there. Right. And uh, unfortunately, I, I, you know, where it happens for a lot of people, I ended up getting into a little bit of trouble, and I kind of detoured a little bit of my, co my college career for a second. Mm -hmm. So Northeastern uh, was supposed to transfer into Northwestern to play uh, safety there with actually with one of my close friends there, and he actually passed away on the practice field. Oh, wow. Yeah, so – uh, after that, that, you know, I wouldn't say it so much it soured me, but uh, I just kind of felt empty for a little while. And that was pretty much at that point, it was kind of like the end of, you know, my, my college football career from college. that standpoint. So, so it, just, it was like the passion, it was like the passion kind of just dissipated, like all the energy kind of got sucked up out of the room after that moment. A little bit. I mean, you, you're dealing with, the thing about it, especially, you know, my story from what I'm about to say, it's probably no different from a lot of kids from the south side of Chicago, but mm -hmm. I had two friends growing up who were murdered, including my best friend. This was going into that senior year. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it was a lot of aspects as far as me, you know, battling those, those, de those, those demons. And then, honestly, within our community, we really don't really, you know, talk about the aspect of, you know, maybe going to therapy and talking to a therapist and, you know, the good things that can kind of come out of, you know, having those conversations, you know, right. with a professional. So you're, you're dealing with a kid who was dealing with, you know, this murder and death in, in his life and who probably really didn't really handle it, you know, the right way, way at the time. It's so trauma. by the time my friend passed away, dude, I just went almost into a deep depression for a while. Right. You know, no, and, and, and that's and that's that's really so poignant because it is that that's a sitting trauma. And look, from from a lot of entities like and we're talking about it probably was a catalyst trauma, but we're talking about probably years of issues already building up to that point. This exactly. just happened to be just one that just pushed all the the, the pressure downward. And so you're just kind of like sitting on it and you have to deal because it, especially at the time, especially in the 90s and really up until the last like year or two, let's be honest, really the last year or two, that you always, the concept is, yo, be a man about it. Yo, you got to take it in, absorb it and just deal and like come to terms with it on your own. Don't, you know, especially so I can imagine how much weight is going into that, especially for the people that close to you. These are formative right. people for you. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so what ended up, oh, oh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, so what ended up taking you over to trying for the AFL? Uh, just at the time, uh, I had a buddy of mine who was playing uh, at a uh, Quad City, man, and just felt like, man, I should be, you know, I still should be playing some uh, football. So I ended up do doing that, and then I ended up playing in the, the AFL for a few years. And then uh, I had another friend of mine who played for the Indianapolis Colts at the time. Mm -hmm. So he was like, yeah, hey, listen, man, you know, you know, I understand everything what happened, man, but, man, you just got a lot of football left. You know, you know, let me go and get you ready for the pros. Let's, let's go and get, you know, you know, work on our 40 time bench, you know, all that stuff, you know, everything that you have to do as far as getting ready for the combine itself. And, you know, we'll kind of go from there. So I did that, uh, was working hard, doing what I need to do as far as preparing myself for that particular combine. It was a, basically it was almost like a scout combine. Right. So it was the uh, arena teams there at the time, the XFL actually had just started as well. Mm -hmm. So it so was this is about 2001 ish. Right, right. So the original XFL. So there were arena teams, uh, more arena teams there, XFL teams there, and a couple of NFL teams there. Uh, and uh, everything was going wild, uh, going great. Actually, I did a 225 on the bench 21 times. Nice. And when I was running my 40, I tore my hamstring. You know? Dang. Tore my hamstring. Uh, like, I remember getting helped off the track itself. And uh, that was the end of the combine. 
Uh, I remember going back to my car, and when I got to my car, I was literally in tears because I heard it pop. I was in a, a, a tremendous pain, and then even besides that, in the back of my head, in my back of my head, I was like, you know what? It's over. With. Right. You know, the, the the dream is done. It's done. So uh, once that happened, uh, I don't think I really played any sports probably for about a year and a half where I was right. just trying to wait, you know, wait for my hamstring to kind of grow up. I mean, uh, to uh, heal up. And the hamstring takes forever to go. Like, I remember when I popped my, I popped my hamstring, um, actually doing that for college, running, mm. running the 40. And I, like, I remember literally just hearing it. And I've never had any major injuries up until that point. Me and you either. hear pop. And it's just like your leg just goes stiff and you're just like, what is happening? And, you know, it's one of those that like it's low key. It takes forever for that to heal. And, and that that mental setback on it where you're just like, yo, can I run again? Because you feel like it doesn't feel bad after a few weeks, but until you start running again and then you're like, yo, I can't I can't move it. And then it, the months that it takes for it to like I the That's point the is, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, like, yeah. It, t- it took so long. I remember the. The doctor at the time gave me a couple of different options. It was, okay, you can have surgery, but if you have, have the surgery, you know, you probably won't ever really be able to, you Get know, speed play back. sports the way you want to play sports ever again. Right. He's like, or oh, because it's a tear, but, it, you know, it's not a complete full tear. He's like, you couldn't necessarily just rehab it and, you know, kind of see how things go. You know, now right. today, if something like that was to happen, you know, you get the surgery, you know, you're back right. on the field probably, you know, you know, you know, f- you know, three to four, three to six months. You know, back then, you know, you, you're talking about what, early 2000s, you know, I didn't know what was going on. You right. know, so like I said, I just went on elected to just rehab it and see how it goes. And it took me, like I said, a probably about a good year and a half, almost close to two years where I felt I can actually run full speed again. Yeah. And not worrying about it actually pulling or popping or tearing. Right. So, so with that in mind, all right. And, and, and with all that buildup, what was the time between whenever your hamstring started finished, basically getting to a, an acceptable point of healing to whenever you started playing, whenever your friend introduced you over to rugby, man, six years okay five or six years basically so it, wasn't, it wasn't just like out of sports for 18 months like you were out of sports out of sports <laughs> <laughs> but yeah hey i hey i was done <laughs> i was done I, I, I was done you know i was beyond done you know it, it was funny because at the time so uh uh, D Way ended up getting drafted uh, by the Miami Heat, and then another one of my buddies was Lance Lance Briggs, who's all pro linebacker for the Bears for the Chicago Bears. Yeah, right. right. And then another one of my boys was Corey Patterson, who ended up getting drafted by the Chicago Cubs at the time and played center field for the Cubs for about Corey's Cubs. I want to say about six or seven years. Yeah. So right at that exact same time, I had three people that I really knew who were, you know, they were playing pro sports in three different sports. Okay. So uh, uh, up until then, I was like, okay, I need to finish up school. I finished up school. Cool. And when I was finishing up school, I was like, okay, well, I need to have some type of job where I'm trying to make certain things work. So I ended up working in insurance for my uncle for a second. And then I ended up taking this job at this nightclub. And when I ended up taking the job at the nightclub, I ended up getting introduced to that whole, you know, nightlife in, in general. Right. Promoter so, life. Promoter right. life. Right. So by the time Lance gets drafted with the Bears, uh, Corey gets drafted with the Cubs, and then uh, Dwayne gets drafted by the Miami Heat. Right. I've actually been working uh, off and on in the nightlife in Chicago for about, you know, three years or so to the point where I'm, I'm like, okay, you know what? You know, I see a lot of promoters making a lot of little money, man. I, you know, I could do this. And I got boys already playing in the, in the pros, so – why not just start handling a lot of my boys' parties? Right. And that's basically what I did. So from that time of not playing, over the next six years, I've turned myself probably into, you know, with the help of, you know, some of my other business partners. Uh, shout out to Big Six Entertainment. But uh, I turned myself from somebody who nobody never even heard of in the nightlife scene to probably the biggest promoter, if not the biggest promoter in the Midwest at one point. Nice. You know, and I, I did parties, like I said, Vic, uh, 
Uh, I've done stuff like Peyton Manning, ESPN. My uncle Scoop uh, worked for ESPN, so he ended up, you know, putting me on to that aspect. So I ended up doing some ish, uh, parties and events for ESPN and ESPN Magazine. Uh, I mean, I probably worked with about 115 pro athletes, you know, nice. something during their different events. Chris Paul, uh, I mean, almost anybody you can kind of think of at some point, uh, you know, within the last, what, 15, 20 years, I had done events for them. You know, and I, I had done that to, to a point where, honestly, I was just I was just kind of done playing sports. Right. You know? I mean, because at that was point, it, it, it was basically all the sports aspect of the connection without having to go through the arduous, you know, physical journey of having to play. Like, oh, yeah. it, they always talk about, like, whenever athletes get out of uh, pro or heavy sports, it's usually not the – the preparation and the game time that always gets it. It's the time you spend in the locker rooms. It's the right. time you're healing with your teammates and that, that social aspect. That right. Comes right. And, I, and I was still getting that social aspect because right. I mean, hanging out with them and hanging out with their teammates and, you know, you know, being young in Chicago, you know, uh, which is, you know, in my opinion, the greatest city in, in the world, you know, I mean, no bias, I just, no, no bias, no bias, no, no bias, 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 bias. But, <laughs> but you know, so I was still able to get you know that 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 aspect as far as you know, hanging out with the boys, being in that kind of that, that locker room type feel, right? Uh, cracking jokes and yeah. uh, a lot of the times, uh, you know, even going to the gym with them, you know, what I'm saying. So it was still an aspect where I was still kind of really being competitive, but it was just a different aspect of being competitive, right? So, I, and I'm, I'm going to touch on this a little bit more a little bit later because I think there's just, there's a lot to be able to, that I want to ask on in, in terms of it. But I want to kind of finish out kind of this, this journey, this rugby journey that you had, and then we'll tap, tap through that because it's important. Mm -hmm. um, so you've done this for these six years, man. You've now, you've now entered into the, into the, you're basically the work life, all right? You know, you're entertain you're working entertainment, you're still working with these, you're building those connections, but... What ended up having you come back was to to actually playing physical sports. Like at that point, there's no reason for you outside of like a casual game here or there, maybe some basketball. You know, maybe if you did flag, I don't know if Chicago goes hard with flag like that. But you know, outside of that, you know, you got your boys. You're already working out with them. So why why listen to your homegirl and go? All right, let me go check out this rugby thing. So what what got you to that point? My, I got a little brother, uh, well, he's like a little brother to me, uh, a guy named Chris Gopher. And uh, Chris, uh, you know, he was an athlete himself, played uh, college ball at Youngstown State, mm -hmm. uh, played arena ball, ball as well. And Chris was kind of chasing that NFL dream, you know. And uh, truth be told, I really felt, you know, I remember watching him work out and how, how passionate he was as far as, you know, trying to chase that dream. And I remember in the back of my mind, I was like, yeah, man, I wish I would have, you know, I wish I would have went on, you know, kind of refocus myself and just try it one more time. You know what I'm saying? So it was like this aspect of like, you know, being happy where I was, mm -hmm. but not really fe feeling fulfilled as far as what I did athletically. Right. You know, always kind of feeling like, you know, like, man, I'm a great athlete and I never really got a chance to really see how great I could really be, right. you know so it was just it was just this always constant nagging where I was happy, but deep down when it came to sports, I wasn't happy. You know, it was like you know watching football and then be like, oh, he ain't better than I me. I could do you know that. Right? <laughs> look, yeah. man, you know, I yeah. I, I could have yeah. been like, I, I know exactly how they go. No. That could have been me, but yeah, I, I remember one time, you know, I was I was, I was hanging out with Lance one time, and it was me, Briggs, and a few other guys, and. You know, they were just talking. I was like, man, none of y'all better athletes than me. And they all, like, looked at me. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> when I was dead serious. You know what I'm saying? And, I mean, and everybody in the room, they're all NFL players. You know? Right. You know, Briggs, they was Bob Sanders. Like, I was like, dude, y'all not better athletes than me. You know? I, and I was dead serious. You know? So, it was that aspect where it was like, you know what? I don't know what I'm going to do, but if something was to ever come up, you know, maybe I should probably take a, take advantage of it, you know, right. take a chance of it, you know, working out again, not really thinking about if it was going to be rugby or even if it was football, but just like, you Something. know, let's kind of maybe start staying ready a little bit. Right. You know, you never know. So, so, so then, so you, you're, you're doing these, you're still doing these workouts and then how, how, how'd she end up broaching this to you? Like, because look, 
let's let's be honest. You know, when it comes to rugby, aside from the fact that we never really know about it prior to, but it does go back into the. It's not really a sport that people in the black community typically know about, and if they do, it really goes into the yo. This is a, this is a strong white boy sport. I always I always and to this day I still call it. This is like um, uh, Tommy Boy rugby from that movie. Tommy boy, like the beginning where everyone's just like drunk and you're like, no, this is some frat shit, you know, something like that. But, uh, but, but for you, you know, whenever your homegirl like brought this to you, like what, what was it that was like, okay, let me go, let me, let me go test this out. Let me go see what she's talking about. Well, like I said, for her, she was really just trying to meet some, you know, some new friends at the time, you know? Uh, so for me, it was really more being, you know, supportive of her. Uh, and then when I actually, and she actually ended up, I quit maybe like two or three weeks later. She was like, it just wasn't for her. Right. Uh, but for me, uh, once I really started to really kind of like pay attention to a little bit, I was just, I was just really intrigued. You know, uh, I love the aspect where it was kind of like a little bit like football because I played basketball. I also could see the basketball aspect of it. I think sometimes when people talk about rugby, they constantly compare it to football and the sport itself is a little bit so much more. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's that aspect of, yeah, it's it's like football, don't get me wrong, but it's also like soccer. You know, it's mm-hmm. also like basketball a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, if you are a kid, especially how I grew up, you know, when you're playing point guard, you know, being able to set your man up, that's all rugby is. You know, right. so so for me, when I was just really just watching the sport, I was like, man, dude, this is this is this is you know, it's it's really interesting, you know, and then by the time they finally got me out to a practice. Uh, I'll be honest, with you, I think I was sold the very first practice. Yeah. Very first practice. I, I couldn't have been no more than about 15, 20 minutes into the practice. And I had had so much fun. I literally said to myself at one point in my head, I was like, dude, I should have always been playing rugby. <laughs> I'm sure. That's kind of like, how I felt. That's you know? real. Like, you know, I, it, it, it had a similar effect even for me because it was just like, so I know for my first practice, it was the competitive side that really kicked off. And it wasn't even like, it wasn't really like we did anything significant. Uh, you know, it was good. Like it was practice, practice is practice. But I remember whenever I was like, I was there and we started doing like just basic uh, cone drill stuff like endurance. And it was just like, I would start running and then they kept going and I'm going and they're going. And I'm going and they're going and I'm slowing down and they're going and I'm starting to slow down and I'm going. I'm like, yo, these old dudes who are like getting going. I'm like, I can't, I can't let these guys do it. Yeah, like they're yeah. mid thirties, forties. They're still chopping out like that. But Dude, you know, it, 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 was had, yeah. it had that aspect, you know, but yeah. it was just like, it catches in and then you just like, okay, yo, these dudes are cool. Oh, oh, we doing stuff afterwards. Right, 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 right. It was funny because I remember uh, uh, I was listening to Slum Village at the time, and I, they had a, a verse where he was talking about, man, he's from Michigan, man, but he should have been born in Great Britain. <laughs> you know, And I've always loved that verse because when I first started playing rugby, I was like, man, dude, I, man, I wish I wouldn't I would have been born in you know, New Zealand or England. Boy, my <laughs> Might be in a premiership right now. What's going on? You know, like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know. So, which was, you know, that was kind of how that, you know, that. I mean, that goes more into that story itself. But, it, you know, that was part of why when I even when I first started playing, I was always in the back of my mind. I like do at some point I gotta get overseas. Right. So I gotta get overseas. The more I start the learning about the sport, uh, and just understand how big the sport was outside of the u.s right i was like well, i gotta get overseas i got right get so look you know you go on to this club and chicago griffins aren't a slouch club like this is a legit club out out, out in these streets um uh, hard I, and this was about what year 2007 2008 well i played with the chicago west side condos which was like a division two team okay division two, where they were division three and they just promoted to division two so i played with them um for about a year and a half, maybe about two years. Mm-hmm. And I was paying attention to the Griffins and the Lions a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, at the time, they were playing in the USA Super League. And I was like, well, look, man, you know, I love the sport, but at some point, if I really, really want to get better, I'm going to have to play against better competition. Right. And I got two Super League teams right here in the U.S. Right. You know, uh, I mean, right here in Chicago. In the state, in the right, city. You know, yeah. Right, in the city. So, uh, 
I was trying to I was trying to get some information about the Lions and I was trying to get some information about the, the Griffins. And then it was actually one of the, my friends with the Condors was like, listen, one of our boys just went over to the Griffins last year. Uh, a guy named Corey. He plays wing just like you. You know, why don't you reach, reach out, go talk to him. There's another guy uh, over the name of uh, Brendan Brown. And, you know, just go talk to them. So I reached out to both of them and I decided to come out to a game. So I get out to a game, and lo and behold, I realized that Brendan Brown's a brother. So I'm like, <laughs> more of us? Another one? Another one? <laughs> right, you know, another one? So I'm talking to Bren- Brendan, man, and BB, uh, you know, who's just a, an absolutely beautiful brother. Mm-hmm. You know, BB's talking to me, and he was like, man, yeah, dude, you know, we'd love to have you over, man. This is a great club, man. He was like, you know, I'm not trying to discourage you about the Lions or anything like that. He was like, I'm just tell, telling you from, from the perspective of, you know, I've been with the, with the club uh, for, you know, almost 10 years, and which is crazy. No. If people, when people really know, if people out there know about BB in the rugby circles, yeah, think about it. 10 years then, and he was still playing. He'll still lace up sometimes now. Yo, but, look, <laughs> one thing that it had really always kept me about rugby was yeah. the longevity that people have in the sport. Like, about, like you're getting hit, but you think, okay, you're going to break down after 35, 40. No, 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 right. no, man. These dudes, 50, 60, 70, still right. going hard. And for some reason, like, I look, personally, I've always hated playing old boys because I swear right. their bodies turn to stone. It's like, it's fat. It might be expanded, but it gets harder at for right. some odd reason. <laughs> right, right. Now, and, and I take pride of that. I mean, because even for myself, I mean, I played rugby uh, on a D1 level until I was, what, 40, 41 years old. So Let's go. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's that's an yeah. underestimated, like, uh, 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 access. Like, right. to be able to do that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so BB, man, at the time, like I said, he, he – I just felt comfortable. So I ended up, you know, playing with the Griffins, you know. And uh, from that perspective, it was the greatest decision I ever made in my life just because, uh, one, uh, the guys, they're absolutely great. They've always been great. Uh, But then, two, I was able to kind of really kind of experience, like, the rugby culture. Uh, At the time, the Griffins, we had our own bar called the Black Rock. Mm -hmm. And I think we were probably one of two or three team clubs in the whole U.S. who actually had their own, like, actual team bar. Like right, an actual bar that was dedicated to him. So I was able to kind of see that aspect of it. Uh, we were playing the USA Super League, which at the time I was the you know top premier level to play rugby in the U.S. So you know you were able to play against guys who have played on uh, uh, Samoa's national team and Tongan national team, and you know guys who are overseas uh, from England and New Zealand and uh, Australia. So you were able to play against some really really top level con- you know competition, right? And at the same time, too, uh, the club was just so inviting where it was like, okay, I didn't feel like right off the bat I had anything to prove. I just really had to learn how to play rugby. Right. You know, and from that perspective, it was, it was a beautiful match. It was a match made in heaven. You know, you, you, you were dealing with somebody who was definitely hungry, who wanted to get better, and then I was able to play with a team who were – Accepting of me trying to be able to, you know, grow in, and be a better rugby player as well. Right. It, it gave you. It gave. It, it was a platform that would actually be able to nurture what you you needed and actually feed the hunger the way it needed to be. Because that's exactly. look, it, and which is is tough in and of itself, regardless of of the club. Like especially if you one to be able to make sure you're gelling with people. Two to make sure that you're being able to get pushed past your already known max, and you already have that from doing a little of the AFL from doing. Uh, college stuff, and especially just from, you know, formative years. So you're already going to have a natural proclivity to being like, yo, I, I can go hard. Like, right. let me see how hard we can go. Exactly. Um, and then, you know, so to be a hazard. And look, during that time, during the Super League time, I think that was about the time that I started playing rugby right in the middle, like 2009, 2010-ish kind right. of time. Right. Uh, like, what, what was that experience for you like? Because, you know, that was – I guess the second iteration of professional rugby by that at that point, and we're talking semi pros at that. Like, what was that like for for you at that moment? Uh, I loved it. I mean, similar to where the the MLR is right now. I mean, uh, you were talking about what twelve teams. So you know, you were playing in New York. You were playing down in Atlanta. Uh, now, when life came up, you were playing in Dallas, uh, San Francisco, 
uh, Old Puget Sound, which was D.C. You were playing up in Seattle. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Colorado. So, I mean, we were traveling all over the U.S., man. So, from that perspective, like, the road trips were, were, were a blast. Uh, uh, the competition was fantastic. But, but more than anything else, you can kind of see where the sport was starting to go. Right. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, the demise of the Super League is, is well documented, but you can see how the, the seeds were starting to be planted where you're like, okay, this sport is about to blow up. You right. Know, it's about right. to blow up. It has, it, 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 it's had the right nurturing pieces where it, it has what it needs to be able to start to, right. to right. seed, to sprout. It has right. what it needs to sprout. Right, and no. with somebody like me who was, you know, coming from, you know, an American sport background, right? Uh, I can see it. You know, I can exactly. see, what, okay, you know what? You know, you can really, really grow this sport if you really kind of take care of a, a, a few different things and start getting more high schools and colleges involved. Like, I remember when I first started playing, even, you know, right here in Illinois, I think we might have had, what, 13 high schools that were probably playing it or something like that, mm-hmm. you know, uh, colleges that were playing it but it was more like a club standpoint right compared to like you no know, you look up today what it's i think it's like 60 70 high schools in Illinois to play you know play rugby you know all the colleges have a you know a rugby team even if it's just a a, a club sport itself they all still have a rugby team itself so right. you can see what a sport was starting to grow and that's that's i think that's an interesting point there um but during this time what was happening with the promotions like, because now you, you got weekends that are now taken, and huh, right. when it comes right. to entertainment life tonight, uh, the weekends kind of are the biggest time. <laughs> right, right. Uh, it was, it was, I was still throwing parties, I was still throwing events. Uh, yeah, at the time, too, I also felt like I was starting to get a little bit tired of it. Mm. Uh, you know, I had did it so hard. I mean, I was going out seven days a week, basically, seven days a week. You know, the drinking, the party aspects of it, you know, and what, don't get me wrong, it was the most fun I've ever had in my life. You right. Know? Well, not the most. That's another part. <laughs> but it was up there. It's like, it's like but it was up we're there. top three. It's, we're top yeah, three. Yeah, top three. <laughs> top three life experiences. It's up there. Like, yeah, national promoter. Boom. There you go. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, you know, uh, I was starting to get a little bit stale of it. You know, like I said, just the hassle of it all. Uh, we had a, a night in Chicago, which we had a Friday night at this club called Minx. Right. And we probably had the, the, the best, you know, party, uh, the best party in the city, in, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, on Friday nights. Uh, and then uh, we were just dealing with a lot of little different mess when it came to the city and then other promoters not really handling themselves the way we handled ourselves. We, right. we have always been a, a company and a, and a, a group of uh, partners that, you know, we always felt, you know, it was more about making sure that we have a good name. The money is going to come. Right, you know, right. Sure that people really come to our events. They have a really good time. Uh, we, we make them feel like they're family. And, and you know, we kind of go from there. And we just start seeing that a lot of the different things as far as with the other promoters, that that was starting to bleed into what we were trying to do. So I was starting to get a little bit aggravated from that perspective and a little bit tired as far as just the wear and tear of, you know, having to go out, having to make sure that you're staying relevant in order to make sure that you're meeting new people and getting people out into your events. And I just said at that point, you know, where I think what I really would like to do is kind of shift it more from, you know, throwing events every week to maybe doing more just like bigger events. Right. So I'm going to slowly get away from it and then really doing more like bigger events and then going back to concentrate on rugby, doing a bigger event here go back concentrate on rugby as well. You know? No, and I think that I, I, I can see that. I can see how that, that, that would go, especially, I would assume, especially as you, the more that you're doing it, going into the rugby lifestyle, I mean, right. a lot of those same elements are starting to bleed in. We're talking about the socials. We're talking about the interactions. Right. So it's almost right. like you're getting this layering of everything, which is great. But at some point there's, there's a, there's going to be a balance off that has to, yeah, yeah. Occur, like, you get, the wear down gets real, like you said. Yeah, like, you know, in our community, what well, well, we say, doing too much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're doing, <laughs> doing the most right much. now. Doing the most You're right doing now. Doing the most right now. Yeah, yeah. I was doing the most at that time. You know, and I was like, my body was like, bruh, if you don't give me a break, there's going to be some issues from you. 
it's going to be some major issues for you if you don't give me a break. So it was, it was kind of a perfect storm where when I, by the time I really started getting, you know, focused on rugby, mm-hmm. I was starting to, you know, tail off as far as, you know, wanting to be in the whole, you know, nightlife scene, you know, you know, seven days a week, right. you know, and I made some nice money where it was like, you know what, if I really want to kind of like take a break from that, you know, I could, and it really wasn't going to really affect me or hurt me at the time. Okay. So that's good. So, all right. So you're playing with Chicago lines, you playing in uh yeah. super, it, it was super league and, mm-hmm. um, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, Chicago Griffins, I'm sorry. No, you, know, you, you know, you can get shot for that. I know. know, right? That's all I'm like, yo, let me check myself. Let me check myself. <laughs> Come to White Sox. Come to White Sox. Get me right. Right, right, exactly. And I'm a diehard Sox fan. And somebody, like, you're a Cubs fan, like, what? <laughs> Southside. Southside. <laughs> Die. <laughs> Cubs? Oh. oh. No, if Wrigley really feel ever burnt down, I did it. No, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> so I had to make sure I cleared you up on that one. You know? No, love, love, got love, love for the Lions though too. Though got love for the Lions though. Yeah, yeah, got love for the Lions, but you, Griffins all day. Got oh, Griffins all day. That's family, right? Exactly. So, so, so you're playing with the Griffins, and then Super Lug, Super League ends up coming to an end. Right. Uh, you know, it, it ends up uh, shutting down on itself. So. At right. that point, you know, it changes up the way. I know it's still D1 uh, club still happening, but it changes the way that you guys are trajectory. Right. So right. you go from that point and you find yourself in Manchester. All right. right. All right. How did this pathway go? Because it's almost like you, you spoke it into existence of what the goal was of, yo, right. I want to be able right. to go overseas. Right. So what happened between – your time with the uh, with the Griffins, and then you getting to play with uh, Limes Rugby f- uh, Football Club in in Manchester. Okay, all right. Well, well, basically, kind of what happened was um, Super League had pretty much just disbanded at that time, so it was done. Uh, there were conversations about trying to put something together, which they ended up doing. I think the uh, Pacific or whatever it was, it was, but it was more like West Coast. Right. At the time, I wasn't about to be moving to the West Coast. Uh, so I was just trying to figure out as far as, you know, what could I do to really kind of still keep my dreams going? Because for me, my dream was always, I want to get on overseas. Mm-hmm. And to whatever level I can, I want to try to get over to the pro leagues overseas. I had done enough research. Uh, I knew England had five levels of their pro levels, and I was like, I'm trying to get on overseas. Well, at the time, remember I told you, I was still doing events as well. So right. Chicago actually had hosted, um, uh, and this is before the whole rugby weekend, they hosted uh, a national match. It was USA uh, versus Ireland's second team. And right. Was, right, right. Remember, like it was 2012, 2013. Right. It was, yeah. Well, no, it was even, this was about 20, I want to say 10. Somewhere, somewhere around there. Okay, was so right. this, was, this was before the big Scotland deal that happened in uh, right, Houston. Right, right. Okay. This, okay. this was a match that was played at Toyota Park at the time. Gotcha, gotcha. So it was the USA versus Ireland, and uh, it, was, it was somebody else as well. I can't, you know, excuse me. But, you know, let's say, you know, for the most part, let's talk about, you know, USA versus Ireland. So right. it was USA versus Ireland. And at the time, like I said, I was still doing events. So I was doing – I reached out to USA Rugby, and I was like, hey, you know uh, – you know, if you guys need any any help, you know, with the event, you know, kind of let me know. Uh, I ended up getting uh, connected with uh, a guy over in Ireland and then um, well, Ireland's national team. And uh, he was like, listen, hey, you know, well, if anything, you know, we can probably need somebody to be like, you know, the chaperone and ambassador, you know, uh, with Ireland. You right. know, make sure that they're, they're good as far as after the game and, you know, whatever. Have a good time. So uh, they ended up giving me a pass. I ended up staying on uh, Ireland's uh, on their side, sideline and ended up talking to a couple of different people. One of the guys I talked to in particular was a guy, Roger Wilson. Now, this is before Roger Wilson be- was before became Roger Wilson. Mm-hmm. At the time, he was playing on Ireland's second team, you know, kind of, you know, waiting for that, you know, call up to who he's going to really be on the, uh, on the 18. So, or first team, better said. So, uh, Talking to Roger, talking to a couple other guys, Gary Brown, and then I ended up uh, being introduced to Malcolm O'Kelly mm-hmm. at, at the time as well, who's at one point he was Ireland's all-time uh, leader in caps. So I ended up talking to those guys, and they was like, well, listen, man, you know, you know, we've never been to Chicago. You know, 
uh, could you show us around? I was like, yeah, no problem at all. I got so, you guys. I so got you. They were supposed to be in Chicago uh, just to that Sunday. Right. They end up hanging out with me in Chicago for the next week. <laughs> 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 they didn't have to worry about a match. So, uh, <laughs> so Roger, Michael Kelly, Bob Casey at the time, who played for the London, uh, London Irish. Yep. Uh, Dennis Fogarty, who played a uh, uh, prop for uh, Ireland's national team. Gary Brown, uh, Fergus McFadden. God, uh, this is right, 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 exactly. And this is all right, <laughs> you know, because outside of outside of Bob and Malcolm, all everybody else was still kind of working their way up, you know? right? So this is before they all became these big, huge, right, stupid stars, you know, for Ireland. So uh, they end up hanging out with me for about a week, you know, and we just had an <laughs> absolute ball, you know. I mean, summertime shot was in effect as well. So, you know, we kicking it, you know. So, anyway, towards the end of that, uh, uh, one of the guys like, man, listen, man, if you're ever trying to go overseas, you know, you know, let us know. You know, you know over a conversation, we, you know, we kind of brought it up, you know. And right. then I so, I was like, cool, bet. So, I had reached out to him, and uh, I was actually set up getting ready to go to Ireland. Mm -hmm. Well, one of my guys who originally got me into rugby – was like, hey, we got a brand new director of rugby at, over at LIM, RFC in Manchester, Manchester, England. Uh, I told him about you, and uh, you should give us a, you know, give us a look. So I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, okay. The guy reached out to me, was like, hey, you know, why don't you come on over for a workout, man? If we like, you know, uh, you know, we'll, we'll sign you, we'll bring you along, and I bought a one way ticket. No, no. Oh, you, you knew you were like, look, I'm gonna get this one way or another. I'm I'm, a I'm sorry. I'm a, yeah. I'm good. I'm a, I'm gonna make this happen. I bought a one way ticket, man, and then that was the beginning of my uh, playing overseas for almost three years. Dude, yeah. what what was that? What ended up being for that experience? Because it's really interesting, just in in it, how you're getting that, like these low key contacts that you're having that are very casually done but yeah. also very intentional, uh, are setting this little pathway. And it seems to have been a steady bit of what you've done your entire kind of sporting and, and career. Let's overall, it's always been these little bit pieces. Hey, we knew people. Oh, they hooked me up over here. Boom, boom, boom. So, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, and I'm going to build in on all this because this is really interesting, but I'm really happy to be able to see how this all encompasses. So whenever you get to limb, like what what was that because to be there for three years i mean that means not only did you not only en enjoy the play time yeah. but you had an environmental uh establishment that was there yeah yeah it became it became family uh i tell people even to this day uh manchester england is, is a second home as far as I'm concerned mm -hmm. uh but so i ended up getting over there and it was funny because i remember uh michael which the guy that i know who's you know one of my best friends in life now uh Michael, you know, wasn't able to pick me up from the airport, but the director of rugby was. So yeah. picks me up from the airport and was like, okay, so here's your flat. And, you know, <laughs> practice is going to be tomorrow at 5 o'clock, and somebody's going to be coming by to come pick you up. Like that. Just leave. Easy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> right. Top, top, top. Leave. Hey, we're good. Right. You're good? You're good. Right. Okay. Leaves. And it was funny because it was one of those, uh, I mean, all of, all of it was, was a whole, you know, look at God moment, mm -hmm. you know, because like I said, from the standpoint, me even getting there, I tell people it, it was it was it was God. It was yeah. the aspect of, you know, being in promotion. You know, being able to talk and to speak with people and to network, and how it all helped me to get, get to, to this a point. point where I was able to kind of tie up my athletic career a little bit. So anyway, he ends up leaving, and I remember the doors closed. Right, so I go upstairs. I'm geek. Um, unpacking all my clothes, setting everything up in my flat, you know, I'm, you know, I'm ready to go. You know, then all of a sudden I was like, man, where are my boys at? <laughs> where are my family at? And dude, for a quick second, dude, I was just like, and do I swear, and I ain't got no problem saying this, do I like start crying? <laughs> like, what did I do? No, it's like, yo, did I just get ghosted somehow? Like, like, <laughs> like, what did I do? What did I do? You know, and then I was like, dude, it's cool. You got this. You've been preparing for this, you know, your whole life. You got well, this. Like, Sign let me up. ask this. Let me mm -hmm. ask this. Was that your, so going overseas, 
Was that your first time going overseas? That was my first time going overseas. I mean, I had traveled, you know, to like the Caribbean and stuff like that. But, but that's I mean, not like overseas, man. overseas. Oh, right. Like, exactly. like yeah. okay, I'm, yeah. I'm going to just go over like a slightly larger no. body of yeah. water. No, no, I'm overseas. Like, all I'm gone. Difference, right? I'm gone. <laughs> okay. Like, I can't come back right away. I'm gone. Yeah. Yo. So, well, I mean, even for that, like, just going into, because it makes sense as to why you'd be just, like, so thrown in that right. moment. Because you, it's not just like, oh, man, I'm gone, but I got people who are a few states over. It's like, yo, not only am I not in anywhere, uh, there's nobody in proximity to me that I actually know. Yo, I'm a whole different culture. Like, yeah. even if it's. kids south side of Chicago at the time, dude, I had never even met anybody who's from England. You know what I'm right. saying? Let alone going to go be in England. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I didn't know what was going on. So when it hit me, like I didn't expect that, hit, but when it kind of <laughs> dawned on me what actually ha was going on, the way you know, what was, happened, <laughs> I was like, I can't reach out to my mama. Really? I mean, call her, but I can Skype her. Yo, there's like, no WhatsApp going right, on over there. Right, yo, you can't, like, right, yo, this right. is real payments. <laughs> yeah, ain't no WhatsApp, exactly. No, no WhatsApp going on at the time, you know. Social media was starting to come up, but even like from a standpoint of Facebook and Instagram, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't what there. it is today. Right. You know, like I always tell people, if I actually would have done what I did like now, back then, dude, I probably would have about a million followers on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but so, uh, so anyway, I, I remember I was crying and I said, like, dude, it's cool. I remember taking a shower. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, man, let me just go out in town, man. And I remember leaving my flat. And as I'm walking down the street, I'm walking down these cobblestone streets, man. And I'm like, man, this is cool. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was just, like, I started to just kind of calm down. Like, dude, just, this is a blessing. You know, right. be cool for a second. So I end up going to a pub. And this pub was about to be ready to close, which mm -hmm. it was closing, like, at, like, 9 o'clock. And I'm like. I'm from Chicago. Stuff stays open until like four o'clock. Yo, midnight, two a.m. What, right. what, what you mean by the close at nine o'clock? You know, and uh, the bartender was like, "Yo, it, there's a pub right down the street. You know, it stays open until about two o'clock in the morning. Why don't you mm -hmm. go by there?" So I'm like, "Okay, great." So I walk down the down the street uh, through the village, the main through the village, and uh, get to this bar, and uh, there's this DJ comes up. He's like, hey, mate, how you doing? I was mm -hmm. like, hey, how you doing? He's like, oh, you know, you're from America. I was like, right. yeah, you're from America, you know? And he was like, oh, let me buy you a beer. So he buys me a pint. The owner comes over, and he's like, you're our new American player like that. I was like, yeah, I'm your new American player like that. <laughs> <laughs> he buys me a pint, you know? And then hey, the you guy. You didn't get thrown off by the fact of being like, oh, wait. You know the club over here too, like yo, my information going out like that. <laughs> Dude, I, it caught me for a second, but then at the same time too, I was like, "But that's the reason why I came here." You know, right. over here, rugby is religion. You know, right. what I'm rugby and rugby and football, soccer is religion. So, right. and, and I'm pretty sure they would know if a, a new American was going to be coming in town. Right. Like makes that. sense. Yeah. So there. So anyway, the DJ. He was playing some house music, and I was—I just kind of thought it was weird because, like I said, being from Chicago, you know, house music is is, is king. You right. Know what I'm saying? So I just thought it was weird. So I was like, "Oh man, you play some house music?" He was like, "Yeah, Mike, Mike, yeah, I play some house music." He was like, "I was just DJing in Detroit two nights ago," and I was like, "What, <laughs> bro?" When I tell you, I was like, "Okay, I'm good. I'm straight." <laughs> I'm straight. He giving me too many signs. I'm good. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> this guy saying, look, look, the world really small. Like, you're not alone alone, all right? You're but not alone alone. The odds of literally meeting a DJ the very first night I'm there, who just happened to go, happened to DJ two nights ago in the Midwest. Yeah. I was like, I'm good, man. This is, this is God just telling me, yo, you know what? It's fine. I got you. Trust you know? the plan. Trust the process, baby. Trust the process. You know, and I was fine. I was fine. And from there, uh, it was one of those situations where I was just like, you know what? I'm about to just take it all in. You know, mm -hmm. I'm about to experience England as much as possible. Uh, anytime if I had any downtime, I tried to go travel. I, I hop on the train, even if it was by myself. I hop on the train and go to London and, and, and 
or, you know, go to Leeds, Bath, you know, anything I can do just because, you know, I've always loved history itself. So right. I was like, well, I'm just about to really experience England. Uh, right. it was, I, I never had any issue when it came to just meeting people. So I ended up, you know, getting a group of friends on the team that I was kind of comfortable with. And I was like, you know what, I'm about to take it in. You know, I'm about to really enjoy this process, get better as a player. And then, and then besides that, just enjoy England. And I enjoyed England. I enjoy England. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's, there's I enjoyed England. It's like I I I I enjoyed I, I enjoyed. I, enjoyed England, bro. I, enjoyed <laughs> I was from the South Side of Chicago, bro. I enjoyed. It. But I mean, <laughs> like, yo, like I'm I'm just even thinking about like the the difference. Be- okay, so here's one thing I've always I, I always love, especially why I'm I became such a huge promoter of rugby, and it, a lot of it came from that international experience, and I think. Obviously, I think you'll be able to relate to this. One of the things that I've always been a big believer of is that people need to get out of their area to be able to really, to re- really get, pers- not just perspective, but to really get life. Because right. there is, even if your area feels like it facilitates all the needs that you have, and you have a place like Chicago, it's massive. Right. I mean, don't get me wrong. When I went there, it really felt like just a small Midwest town that happens to be large, which was super weird to me. Which it is. Which it yeah. kind of is. We call ourselves the biggest small city in the world. But yeah, go ahead. It, that was exactly. I, I remember going down like this is the third biggest TV market in the U.S. Mm-hmm. I was like, yo, I feel like Houston felt bigger than this, but it it yeah. So, but you have this this element where it's technically you can facilitate your need. You have the international aspect. Like, there's no reason to leave it. But you go overseas, and now you're seeing life not through foreign in the eyes of America, but you're seeing this international and in its own element. For you, yeah. what, did you feel like you had a completely different perspective of what you saw the world from just that little bit on its own? I'll be honest with you. Uh, the way I looked at the world completely changed. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, right now we have this thing. I want to say I think it's like thirty-seven percent of Americans never leave twenty-five miles outside of their their exactly. where they grew up. You know, which if you think about it, how small-minded you know a good chunk of the population of of uh, our American citizens are. You know, right. that's 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 a, that's a big lot. chunk. That's that a lot of people they, that haven't left. They haven't left how they where they grew up. They've never met anybody outside of the people they grew up with. That's a big chunk. And I really think that's kind of what kind of affects us when it comes to certain things. Mm -hmm. So for me, by the time I got a chance to go overseas and start living overseas, it changes my entire perspective on life, everything, even as far as how I looked at politics, everything completely changed. Uh, uh, I started paying attention to the world a lot more. Uh, I started looking at policies a lot differently, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? From all presidents, from, from Bush, Obama, you know, everything. I started really paying attention to a lot of different things that truth be told as Americans, we really don't pay attention to. Right. You know? So, so from there, it, it, it was just like, you know, you know, it's the world's a lot bigger than just the U S itself, you know? And then even as far as just, uh, just the everyday life, uh, you know, they have a saying over there that, uh, uh, well, better say, you know, over here, uh, we uh, we work to live. Compared to over there, you know, they uh, they live to work. I mean, right. almost, see, we work. We, we, we live we to work. work. To, they, they work they live, to live. We yeah, live right. to work. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I messed that up. But, <laughs> but yeah, but <laughs> but uh, you know, it was so true. You know, because I will meet people, and it was nothing for them to really enjoy life. To right. at twelve o'clock, saying, you know what, I'm gonna take a little time from work. I'm going to go and hang out at the, at the pub. You know, I'm still going to be produ- productive, but I'm not going to drive myself crazy. Right. You know, when it comes to, you know, hurry up, needing to get back to work or, 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 or feeling that, you know, if I don't do this, this, and this, it's going to completely shut my life down. Right. And sometimes, like I said, as Americans, we can be so focused on work and, and, and on the, the, the all-American dollar that we kind of forget that aspect that, you know, your family, you know, right. spend time, you know, one thing that this quarantine has done more than anything else is kind of put all that into a little bit more focus. Right. Now for me, because like I said, I had that experience. I kind of already kind of had that focus, oh, that focus, but it's putting that focus in for a lot of Americans where it's like, you know what? I've been so stressed out, man, about my boss, 
about this and that, then man, I haven't even been paying attention to the fact that my son can dunk now. You right. know, I didn't, I didn't even know that. My, right. my daughter wow. is, is, a, is a world-class skater and I didn't even pay attention to it. You know, this stuff, like I said, when you talk about overseas, they just don't think like that. Right. They don't think like that at all. So it, it changed me completely as far as how I looked at life. Dude, and, and I think that's real because, look, I, I had, look, I, I guess, contextually, like, I've traveled most of my life. My family's from Nigeria, and so, you know, we'd go overseas and go to Nigeria, but there's a difference between knowing it as a kid and understanding it after you've had the experience as an adult, and I felt it far more, um, far more intrinsically after I started going to Asia uh, the last few years, where it was like, just... The things, uh, like you said, things that, that you thought were big just ain't really that big prospectively. You know, some things, like, even, even look, even when we're talking about cultural uh, uh, myths or cultural elements that people will talk about, you know, being overseas, where, you know, there's some elements here and there that might be factual, but it is wild how uh, misconstruing the information about other cultures are through the lens that we're given. And right. this is even from somebody, you know, this is, you're talking about someone who's like, ah, I've, I've learned stuff, you know, you, you, you take stuff in, but you go and you're like, nah, man, I, I didn't have this. I even, I didn't have it. Perfect example, Vietnam. I remember the first time whenever I was heading to Vietnam, I totally thought Vietnam was still like a mad war torn after the Vietnam War kind of country. You know, sometimes you have that, that area that doesn't really recover. You know, it just kind of got hit and then you're just like, ah, it's a slow build. And so I remember about heading over there and I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be interesting. Bro, I get over to Vietnam. I'm like, this place is the most beautiful freaking place I've ever been. Like, these mm -hmm. people are chill. They're crazy, but in a good way. But, right. it, was, right. but right. it was like, it was like, I was like, match. I, I've never been to a place, and this will go with, resonate across Asia, Japan, and all mm -hmm. the countries else. But um, I've never been in a place where I felt so ungodly safe that I was unsettled by how safe I felt. Yeah, like yeah. it was, it was because you'd go into it thinking, oh, okay, no, this place is, is going to be problematic. Yo, Hey, you need to watch. And of course you keep an awareness, but I never, I never had that. I, I never had an era area where there was threat right, around me right. and it even proved itself, but you don't get that unless you travel. You're only going to have the perspective look of what you've been taught right. or what you've seen. So to be able to go overseas, which I yeah. recommend to every kid, especially in, in a place like here in Baton Rouge, where it's one of those where people don't leave out of here um, very often, but let alone go overseas. Like, yo, you need to go overseas because, like you said, the way that you end up looking at the world completely adjusts and completely changes over to that. So, okay. So, so now you've been in Limes. Uh, just quick, what was your first game like uh, in, 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 in Limes? In Lehman. Can you hear me? I lost you for a quick second there. Okay, no <laughs> worries, no worries. It was the last I was like, thing yo, you I, said. I, I'm sitting there, I'm like, yo, he's going in slow motion. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we either kicked into the Matrix or, you know, just things are lagging a moment. Um, all right, can you hear me still all right? Hello. Um. You got me? I, I'm still, give me, yeah, give me, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, I don't know no, if it's no me, my end or your end, but yeah, I just lost you for, for a second now. I, oh, no worries. You dude. good there now? I, I'm good. I got you good. I got you good. Okay. All right. So I was going to say, whenever you playing le in lines, what was your first game like? Because when you had played with the Chicago Griffins, that's a completely different Super League. When you played with the Chicago Condors, that's a different game. So when you played with, uh, with Leams, like, what was that game like? What was it like to play with people who have been playing basically their entire life? Oh, Griff, Griff, lost you there, but hold on. No can, worries. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I can hear you great. Can you hear me okay? I like this. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Can you hear me now? 
Oh, I think I lost you for a little bit. It's all good. It's all good. Make sure my internet's not acting up. All right. You, you, all right. You got me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So I was saying, yeah. right. you know, whenever you first started playing for so Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me okay now? Can you hear me okay now? Come on. You got me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, okay. Yeah, no. So when you first started playing for Leams, yep, I got I got when you first played your first game for Leams, what was that experience like? Because you have one that's with the Chicago Griffins, and that's entering Super League. You have it when you started with the Chicago Condors. What was that? Like, comparatively, can you tell me what each of those first games were like and, and, and what was, the, what was your, your, your take? Because we're talking about literally three different levels of culture, right. let alone skill. Right. Right, right. Well, like I said, when I first started playing that very first game as far as with the Griffins, uh, I mean, well, even way before then, even with the Condors, it was kind of more of the shock, shock of it all, but I kind of felt like it was more of just, you know, uh, the, the the kicking aspect really wasn't really there, you, you know, yet, you know, when you're playing on that level. So it was really more as far as just, you know, making sure you, you really, really kind of run hard and tackle hard. Right. Uh, when it came to the Griffins, uh, that's where you start really seeing more of the skill level really, really kind of kick, you know, kicking up, you know. So from that aspect, it was a complete culture shock. Uh, I think I spent most of that 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 first season with the Griffins, basically kind of like trying to work my way up to like the first team, you know, um, in which I finally did towards the end of the year, you know, which was great, uh, and it, it was able to. Uh, played uh, a lot in the last like five or six games, including our playoff uh, game down in life at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, from that perspective, you know, it was a, it was a complete difference from a, from the, the, the tactical standpoint of playing rugby. By the time I got to uh, playing in England and I obviously I wasn't playing on their first team right away. Even that second team, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Rugby. You know, and uh, like I said, we're playing in the, in the national leagues. I don't know if, if you know, you know, for your viewers, they're not really familiar with how England's pro levels are, you know, set up. You have like the Premiership, you have the Championship, and then you have the national leagues. You know, National League one, two, and three. So we're playing in the national leagues. Uh, uh, I think we were playing. Uh, I can't remember who we were playing. At. Might have been playing Waterloo or something like that, which is like in Liverpool. Uh, but I remember getting out there and the game started and the first thing in my head was like it's so much kicking <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah yeah i'm running right you know because i'm playing wing at the time you know oh god you know, some people yeah yeah right? <laughs> some people you know they've known me you know later on in my rugby career when i when i started playing more like flanker and you know and prop you know, I was getting a little older, you know, joking rugby, you know, the older you get, you know, you kind of slide it. <laughs> you kind of <laughs> slide it. So I'm playing wing, bro, and I'm like, I'm just running, bro, just <laughs> running. And I'm like, why did you just keep on kicking the ball? And it was funny because the very first game, actually, I, no, no, what it was, we were playing down at, uh, down in, um, I can't remember that. But the very first game, it was a monsoon. It mm -hmm. popped my head. Sorry, we were playing in a second. It was literally it was a monsoon. Like it was raining so much. So I'm running. My boots feeling heavy. The field is like filling up, you know. And I get to the guy by the area tackle. He kicks it off. I'm like, dude. Yeah. I'm running. Back. <laughs> it was almost like, like they had like a, a a target on my head. Like that's the American. They don't really kick that much, you know what I'm saying? So we just gonna kick all damn dog on day, all day long. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, man. So, from that perspective, it was just shocking. Just from, like I said, how much of a difference just the amount of kicking that goes on when you play it over in England compared to you know what I was used to playing in the Midwest. Right. You know? So, so from there, dude, it was just it was it was crazy, man. It was crazy, and, and it took me. I would say, it took me probably about five or six games where I felt like, okay, you know what, it's starting to slow down a little bit. You know. Right. Why? Where you know I'm starting to really understanding the you know my positioning and where actually I really need to be you know in the field to you know you know defensive wise and even offensively you know just because you know one thing about it when you you're playing uh, over in England you know your positioning when it comes to even just you know receiving the kick 
it, it has to be in, in a certain particular uh, area in the field. So, so it took me a while for me to really understood exactly where I was supposed to be, you know. And then once I did, you know, I was kind of fine. Boom. I was kind of fine. The biggest Yo. thing for me was at that point, I realized I need to learn how to kick. You know, it, being honest, I can't be wasting all this time running. Like this, this is just too much damn running that's going on right now. Uh, I was kicking a little bit, you know, but for the most part, even when it came to the Griffins, if somebody kicked it deep to me, I'm feeling this boy like I'm Devin Hester, and we gone. <laughs> Simple as that, you know. We gone. You know what I'm saying? I know I'm six feet. You know, uh, two fifteen. Yeah, if you want to tackle, tackle me, good luck. You're right. You know? <laughs> Good luck, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, whatever. Because I remember even at the start of games from – even when I was in, in England, I remember I lined up at the start of the game, and guys like, that's a big-ass wing out of tackle today. <laughs> like that. So, so I really wasn't even used to kicking, man. And I was like, you know what? I got to kick. And then, like I said, my buddy, again, Michael Sweatman, mm -hmm. uh, he was like, look, you know, at the practice, we're going to just start staying out there, and all we're going to do is kick. And I remember just kicking, dude, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of balls, man, to, to when I felt really comfortable as far as kicking. I still didn't kick that much because I still just tried to stay with my bread and butter. But right. I did know that if I had to kick, I you could. Had it. Yeah, I, I could kick. And that and was that, probably that, some of the biggest difference. You know, it, it was it, it, it's something similar to uh, I, when I was talking to Phil Thiel um, uh, some a little while ago on another episode, and I asked him about whenever he played the All Blacks, and I always said like, "Yo, what is the difference between playing at that level versus others?" Because you know the the presentation of rugby is basically the same at all levels. It, right. You pass, you tackle, you kick, yada yada yada. But what makes such a difference between these guys that have been playing all their lives versus uh, – and obviously there's, you know, uh, IQ, but, yeah. like, what is the biggest difference? And he was like, you know, it would be a situation where I would go in and I see the guy and I know he's about to have the ball. And mm -hmm. I go in and I tackle the hell out of this all black. Mm -hmm. And I get up and the guy doesn't have the ball. And right. it's just the speed, like, it's the speed, speed and the quickness of that knowledge of how to move the ball. And it sounds like it was the same with you with kicking. It was like, it's not so much that you didn't have the athleticism or you didn't even have the talent, but these guys are moving the ball in a different way because they're seeing the field in a much wider scope than mm -hmm. the, 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 I guess, the limitations that you we would have been used to or you would have been used to. In right, right. And like I said, even the piggyback off what Phil was saying, just even as far as the passing, the passing, how quick they were getting the ball out of their hands. It was just like, you know, so, it, you know, it just it, it almost kind of catches you off guard a little bit because, you know, you may play against, you know, uh, like I said, when we were playing in the, in the Midwest, even in the Super League at the time, you might play. Like, I remember San Francisco was a perfect example at the time. San Francisco, San Francisco Golden, Golden Gate. Golden Gate. Yeah. Right. They were probably one of the better teams in the U.S. in the U.S. Super League at the time when it came to just getting that ball out of their hands. You know, yeah, that ball was in, in, in the scrum. You better believe that ball could be all the way on the other side of the field within probably ten to fifteen seconds, if if it even took that long. I wouldn't even say it even took that long. Right. They were probably one of the few teams that I remember. They were so quick as far as making that transition, getting that ball out of their hands. When you when I got over there, every team you played with was like that. Jeez. Every game. It didn't make a difference if it was first team or second team. You could be looking at, th at a third team game. You could be looking at an old boys game <laughs> and you would, you would be shocked about how quick they got the ball out of their hands. Right. How quick they move the ball from one side of the pitch to the next side of the pitch. You know? So from there, man, it's, it, I, I tell people more than anything else, it's that aspect of Playing a game so long that everything is like second nature. You know, right. one thing about what we're trying to grow right now as, as a nation, as a rugby nation, is being able to have kids where they've been playing the game since they were five and six years old. Right. So when they're doing things, it's, it's, it's second nature to them now. You know right. what I'm saying? So them, the, it, it doesn't make a difference. It's, it's just like that. They're not even thinking about it at the time. You know, it's, just, it's muscle memory at that point. You know, right. so, so for me, and, and like I said, Phil, I'm pretty sure he felt the same way or anybody else who's ever played like high level rugby. Uh, it's, it's that aspect where you're going against guys who from a muscle memory standpoint, 
it, this is just them walking and chewing gum at this point. Right. They've already done their proverbial 10,000 hours and just, it's just, it's, it's just in it. It just is. It no longer is. I'm going to, I'm trying. It just, it just is. I make the move, this play. I, it just is. I do this check, check, uh, checkmate move or whatever. This ch- right. chess move. Exactly. So, and you had that for three years, which must have been amazing and just being able to get that aspect. And then you end up coming home and I'm assuming you just get back to playing rugby just as normal. So, well, 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 basically kind of what happened was, you know, I, it was uh, I was over there off and on for about three years, about two seasons. I uh, came home and uh, uh, I was actually about to get ready to, you know, probably head back overseas at the time. And then I, I met a young lady. Well, not, not so much I met. Uh, there was a young lady that I had known for years that I kind of always was kind of chasing and stuff like that a little bit. That, that one crush that's always, like, been sitting in the back. <laughs> All right. And, uh, uh Honestly, we just start dating and then uh, and look up. Uh, uh, we were about to have a kid probably about a year later. You know, wow. so it was one of those situations where uh, I kind of felt, you know, she gave me the, the option where, you know, I probably could go back overseas. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I didn't really think it was probably the smart thing to do just because, uh, you know, I grew up with my mom and dad, you know, in the household at the same time. And I knew how important that was to be, right. uh, you know, involved in, in the house. So I never really, really gave it too much of a, of a thought as far as, you know, heading back overseas, you know. And uh, I had a couple of bigger clubs at the time because I actually played so well towards the end of that season uh, where I had a couple other clubs that, you know, uh, knew about me, had reached out to me uh, and um, I had some connects also as far as in the championship so I definitely thought about it as far as, you know, you know, going back over and, you know, maybe trying to continue my rugby career from a, an international perspective. Right. But I, at the time, I figured, like, you know what, dude, you, you 35, you, well, I was 35 at the time, mm-hmm. 35 years old. You probably might have maybe Two, one or three more years, years left, mm-hmm. maybe something like that. Uh, why don't you, you know, similar to how when you already make that transition from that nightclub scene, Maybe it might be time for you to start making that transition from rugby, you know, uh, to, you know, being a father. Right. You know? uh, and I was still able to play, you know, with the Griffins for, you know, a few years, not full time anymore. Right. But, you know, a little bit to the point, you know, where, you know, I still was able to kind of scratch that itch. You know, I was about but, to say, satisfy the itch, but it's not going to take it like I'm not maximizing the, the right, situation right. like it was before. Right. But I, I was actually to a point where, honestly, those old demons uh, that I dealt with from uh, some of the tragedy I had, you know, uh, from growing up and in college and stuff like that, I was finally at peace. I didn't really question what had happened in the past anymore. I didn't really feel bad about my football career anymore. I was finally at peace because I know at least for a few years of my life, I was able to get everything out of my body. You know, and I was able to see exactly what type of athlete, you know, I was even at the ripe old age at that time of, you know, playing in my, you know, my early 30s, you know, but I was still able to see exactly what I could have been, you know, if, you know, some of those you know different things didn't happen, you know, right. and like I said, I pretty much, you know, you know, started to go into fatherhood and simple as that, man, that's, that's kind of how that dream kind of ended from that, from that perspective. So this is where I want to come. And I, I'm glad that we had the whole setup on that because it, it, it provides the other aspect that I always say, which is what ends up coming as a result of being able to have this. And, and you've touched on it so many times where it was your networks, your networks, your networks. 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 Um, you know, for you, you coming off of these rugby experiences, what have these, do you feel like, what have you seen as kind of the sown seeds that have come from these networks? Because you talk about like your best friend, Mike, at coming out of uh, Leams, uh, your friend that allowed you to enter into uh, the Griffins, uh, to the Condors, and then subsequently using them to get you into the Griffins and, and all that, like all this network connection. How have you felt like it's been able to provide some maybe interesting opportunities more? Uh, now that you're not maybe playing as much? 
Well, I think right now uh, I'm still involved with the Griffins from a, a board member standpoint and uh, mm -hmm. uh, helping the club out as far as that. And, and then I'm, you know, talking to some people over at the Lions as far as uh, us really trying to work together, the two clubs as well. Uh, so for me now, I think my biggest thing that I need to do right now when it comes to rugby is as long as it doesn't affect little man because right. another conversation, you know, because uh, he's a he's an athlete as well. Uh, my thing is, what I want to do now, right now, is grow the sport even more in Chicago. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, I think we've had this this I want to say culture in Chicago where a lot of the clubs didn't really de you know deal with each other uh, within the within uh, the Lions perspective in the Griffins. Some of the old boys didn't like each other and epic like rivalry Griffin. mess. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of. And a lot of that, man, doesn't really grow the sport itself. Right. Um, and for me personally, I feel like that's part of my next chapter in the sport, which is helping grow the sport as one in Chicago, in the Chicagoland area. And then two, uh, you know, you know, being an African-American, you know, uh, uh, being able to expose the sport to, uh, you know, kids who look just like me. Right. You know, uh, uh, being able to talk to their parents and being able to to relate to them being able to talk to a, this business owner and tell them, Hey, this is why you should probably, you know, invest in this particular sport. This is right. what you can kind of get out of that investment itself. You know? So I feel like I'm in a unique uh, position right now where uh, I feel like the next chapter of my rugby career is going to be a lot bigger from a national perspective and a lot more involved as far as really actually growing the game. Uh, you know, I've been meeting people, you know, uh, involved with USA Rugby, and I got friends who with the MLR. Uh, right. I'm really hoping at some point uh, Chicago was able to actually have a franchise right. uh, and, you know, to be involved with that aspect, you know. But, you know, to be able to promote the sport within my, my community is probably one of the, the biggest things that I, I really want to do right now because it's oh. such a great sport right. and there's so many opportunities you can get by playing a sport. And there's so many people who are just playing football and basketball and the odds of you making it to the NBA and NFL, it's tight. It's, it's a know? fraction of a fraction of a percentage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying that, you know, playing rugby, you have better odds making it to, to the premiership, but you can play some great, high level rugby that allow that will allow you to travel and to make a career and to be able to set yourself up for the next, you know, 40, 50 years. Right. You to have that in a sport where it's just not a lot of you. A lot of right. kids look like you. You know? So that's my that's my biggest thing really right now is making sure that I'm just constantly trying to grow the sport and then like I said to try to grow the sport a little bit more in, in, in the Chicago area, especially within our community. You know, I, I, it's, you know, it, it's always been a personal mission of mine within that, especially, you know, especially outside of the pitch, because right. I think sometimes it can get to a point where it's like, yo, you know, let's get, let's get black people into the sport. Oh man, the athletic change up, blah, 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 blah. And I like, yes, that can be an aspect but I've always felt like when it comes to rugby, you have an opportunity to make up for the sins of the past right. where you can say, look, you are, this is a um, historic enough sport where you're not building it from scratch, right. but this is a young enough sport where you can have something that's different. I, you can see the plausibility of having black uh, professional owners or even black travel rugby teams because the way that the culture of rugby works, you can be professional and being able to travel and play in these tournaments all over the world, all over the U.S. without right. maybe necessarily working within a structured league per se but we want to make sure that the competition is high the co and that even at that is an organization of finding again the right tournaments or creating the tournaments right. um, and, and then it goes to the people who are able to do these things around it whether it's an event coordination promotion whether it's logistics or anything like that and it it provides this relook of how the sport can work for people uh within the community within the yeah. black community particularly and uh, you know, there's a special culture that comes from, especially out of the U.S., yeah. that I think facilitates 
the aspect that the, the portion of rugby that is missing that comes from maybe so heavy of a traditional uh, and calm. <laughs> It, 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 I think so, just because, I mean, and this, this can lead into a, whole, a lot of other different conversations as well. I mean, uh, and I've talked to my club about this. I've had conversations with, uh, you know, members of with the Lions about this. As far as when it comes to, like I said, trying to recruit players. Hey, man, if you're dealing with a kid, you know what I'm saying, from, you know, uh, you know, South Central, or, you know what I'm saying, or, or Brooklyn or the South Side of Chicago, whatever. One thing that we're going to need more than anything else is we want to see some people who look like us. Right. You know? So it's important that if you're really, really trying to, trying to grow the sport, you need to start hiring a lot more African-Americans to help promote and help, help you grow your sport. Right. It's hard for you to say you're trying to grow the sport when anytime we, we look at the representation of the sport, you know what I'm saying, from a national level, from a front office level, level, even with MLR, you don't see a lot of us. You right. Know? And and you have to have us in order to actually even grow the sport. It even comes down to, you know, like I said, this even leads to other things. I've always told people I don't have an issue when it comes to MLR clubs or Super League clubs in the past, bringing in foreign players. Foreign players. Now, but I will tell you this, though. I don't like it when it's a situation where we're bringing in so many foreign players, we're not really paying attention to growing our own right. players. Because at the end of the day, my girlfriend, my wife, uh, uh, my son, uh, my, you know, whatever, uh, my neighbor's kids, they might not know who, who Dan Carter is. And I'll just right. say Dan Carter because that's been some of the rumors. They're not going to know who Dan Carter, Dan Carter is. So, yes, within the rugby community, we know. We're excited about that, but is that really? It doesn't mean anything, right? It's right. Is it really growing a sport within the U.S.? Because those people within the U.S. don't know anybody. Now, if it's Tom Brady signing with D.C., now you change the game, game. Right. right? Yo, you get some traction. But if you're really just signing stars, that you know, in my opinion, the people which we need to really grow our sport, right? Don't really know who they are and don't really care who they are. Is that really helping the sport? Is it really helping the sport when you're trying to go to sport within a community of people, but you don't have a representation of them? Right. You know, and then, you know, I, I always felt that, especially, you know, when we had like maybe last summer, whenever there was that huge signing of all these international players that had names and stuff which like is that. Great. Which yeah. is great. Right. It was like, yo, that's, that's dope. It's like, but ultimately, if I look at it as a casual fan, let me not step aside as a person who knows rugby. As a casual fan, honestly, it meant absolutely nothing. Now, what happens, you, what you do with that, like, hey, now how you promote them and how you interact them into the community, maybe we can do something with it. But ultimately, I need to know what is the name, what is the face that I need to be able to look to, to be like, this is who I'm looking at. Not just, hey, it's more rugby people. The quality goes up, good. But ultimately, I still know no one. And right. face knows no one. It makes it difficult to be able to sell it, which I've been. And I was going to say, as a promoter, you know, you understand the concept of pageantry. Right. Uh, and I've always been an advocate. It's why I created one of the, one of multiple reasons why I created the HBC Rugby Classic was because mm -hmm. I wanted to see that pageantry being done and to be able to be escalated. I want to see music intertwined because we saw that with football in the 80s. We saw that with baseball. We've seen that with basketball heavily throughout the 2000s that right. is a commercial element that we have whether it's through hip-hop whether it's through jazz whether it's through rock a lot of it now hip-hop but it's like it changes the way that we have history 30 for 30s tell us that and right. that alone we're the, we're, the greatest, I, we're the greatest country in the world when it comes to promoting our athletes exactly Commer <laughs> look i will always say like i'm not it doesn't knock international sports as a whole but I will always say, when it comes to commercial sports, I don't think the, anyone can do it as well as the U.S. because there's an obsessive nature that we have for it to create the full experiential aspect, not just the familial story aspect. No doubt. And, I don't think it's anybody like us. I mean, but, but even if you look at football, you know, soccer, look at how much – uh, your EPL, your La Liga has taken from the National Basketball League. Right. I'm just like, look at how much, how they promote their athletes, how it's very similar to the model of the NBA. Right. They, they, nobody is better than us when it comes to really 
promoting a sport. And I really don't think, I really think we shouldn't forget that and get away from that model. It's okay right. to bring in people from overseas that have these great rugby backgrounds, but if you really don't really understand that aspect as far as how we look at athletics in America, um, you're kind of missing the boat a little bit, in my opinion. You know, and like I said, I'm not saying that my opinion is is is, is God, but I mean. At the same time, too, <laughs> the, the 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 numbers will tell you it. The numbers will tell you exactly that. And and I, I'm a big believer on that. And I'm gonna be honest. This this is a conversation we could go into that would create a right, whole right, other like <laughs> two right. hours. Like, right, we could go right. and have so much fun with this. Now, and that might be that might be podcast too. <laughs> <laughs> but look, we gonna have a return on this one. There's no doubt we get a return on this. But you know, uh, uh, for for the sake of of not overwhelming with information uh uh the audience but you know for you when it comes down to what you believe is what was probably the biggest lesson that this journey that you've taken so far has come to you to this point that you said like maybe one or two things that will that you would say is poignant for whatever the next generation of athletes or rugby athletes specifically or or you know uh, black American, African, whatever athletes entering into this this realm. Like, what is one lesson that you feel is particularly important to what you've learned on on this journey? Just being open, being open to experience different things, being open to experience different people, uh, not being scared to be different. You know, what I'm saying you don't have to be a football player, you don't have to be a basketball player, you don't have to be a baseball player. Uh, you can be whatever you really want to be. And when it comes to the sport of rugby, there's nothing telling you that, hey, you can't make it big in this, this sport. There's nothing that anybody is saying that, hey, you know, uh, well, you can't play this overseas. You can't do this. No, you can do whatever you, what you want to do. And it's very easy for people to kind of hear somebody say it, but I'm a perfect example of that. You know, I'm a perfect example of somebody who was open enough to say, okay, you know what? Let me learn as much as I can. Let me be open to meeting as many different people as I can. Let me be open to taking a certain level of criticism so I can get better, you know. Uh, and doing all of that helped me get to where I needed to get from a rugby perspective and, and, I, and I, a lot of aspects of life in general, you know. Uh, but it's, I would say definitely just being open. Being open uh, and, and being okay to know that it's okay for people to criticize you. You know, if they criticize you, that means they care about you and they're trying to get you better. They want you to be better. They want you to be a better person. They want you to grow. You know, they want you to grow as, a, as an athlete. So uh, if there's any lesson I learned, it was that, you know, uh, from my time, from when I first started playing rugby to when I stopped playing, uh, I never felt that I couldn't, you know, stop learning. I was always trying to learn. I was always paying attention to other people uh, and how they went about their their day to day as far as getting ready for a game or how they handle certain situations or, you know, sitting there and watching film, you know, and, you know, what can I do to be better? What can I do to improve my game? You know, uh, you know, not thinking that I, I'm, I'm, I'm the greatest thing, you know, since sliced bread. No, what can I do, you know, to, to be better every single day. And that's the way I attacked it. Every single time uh, I got on a rugby pitch or I got on a practice pitch, I was always trying to figure out what I need to do to be better, you know, because I just felt like uh, in my head, I wasn't good enough to the point where I felt that I should, you know, think that, you know, I'm the greatest thing since, you know. So I was always trying to get better. Always trying to get better. Oh, dude, that's real. That is that is that is that's not just rugby lessons. That's life lessons right there, yeah. man. Nick, man, I really appreciate you coming through, bro. Oh man, no problem at all, bro. No problem at all. Like I said, any, anytime, man. You want to sit down? We had this conversation. I'm fine. I'm, I'm like I said, I'm still involved with rugby. I'm also this big, huge racing dad right now. So that <laughs> takes up quite a bit of my time, you know, because my son is an absolute beast. I have no problem saying that, but. <laughs> No, uh, no humility. Don't have that humility now. <laughs> Yo, my son is amazing. <laughs> son, it's my son. <laughs> you know, so uh, that takes up a lot of, you know, a lot of our time because he he's first and last as far as I'm concerned. 
Uh, and so, so, so is my better half, especially everything that she's going through and part of her medical profession is going through. Uh, you know, they're the first thing that, that's in, you know, they, that's in my mind on a regular basis. But uh, man, I'm always here. I'm always open to a conversation. I love talking about rugby. Uh, it's the greatest sport in the world. Uh, I'm so blessed that when God gave me an opportunity to, you know, get back into athletics, he said, I got something perfect for you, you know, and he gave me an opportunity to run with it for 15 years, man. And it was, it was, now it was the best experience I ever had <laughs> during that time. <laughs> Amen to that. Amen to that, man. Thank you so much. No problem, bro. Man, I, an, another great interview. It is legitimately another great interview. Uh, thank you to Nicholas Walcott for just being able to take the time. And definitely we'll have him on again. And guys, definitely check out some of our other guests. Uh, obviously, I had my stuff the week before. Red Eddings of uh, Grey Wolves Rugby. We had Charity Williams of the Canadian uh, Olympic Rugby Sevens team. Uh, we've had... Uh, Chetta Emba of the USA Women's Sevens Team. Uh, we've gone Naya Tapper of the USA Women's Sevens Team. Blaine Scully of the USA Men's Sevens Team. Um, uh, just going down the list. We have had some amazing guests. Uh, I, I don't even remember it in order because now it's starting to pick up and, and you start to forget. But, you know, Kyle Grant, Kyle and Tiana Granby, Chise Bailu, um uh, uh, Mike Toussaint and 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 of Prayer View A and M Rugby, like so many guys. It's it's we're getting an eclectic list, and we got so much more coming. Like, tell your friends about it. Please give us a ranking, a rate, a, a, a review on the Apple Podcast or wherever on Spotify as well. Let people know if you guys find these interviews really interesting, really engaging. Please go ahead and uh, pass the uh, pass it over to somebody. We want to make sure that not only is it just telling the stories, uh, but we want to make sure that these people aren't forgotten, understand the contributions that are done, and yo, it makes it even more fun to keep getting more and more guests and more and more interviews because you know the rugby world has so many stories. Uh, guys, of course, go again check out rugbyoutletmall.com uh, check out the documentary series Singapore to Tokyo any way you can uh, I promise you, you guys are going to enjoy it, it is well worth it 7 episodes four, uh, 20 minutes per episode it's a quick and engaging watch and uh, you, you, guys, you guys won't regret it, but in the meantime I hope you guys have a great week I hope you guys stay healthy, happy and highly favored, my name is Gift Gift Time at Baylu, and I will see you next week